हेलो हेलो आवाज आ रही है मेरी मेरी आवाज आ रही है हाँ मेरी आवाज आ रही है आपको मैं अंकुर बोल रहा हूँ एकदम क्लियर है कि प्रॉब्लम ठीक है ठीक है ओके थैंक यू एडमिट करवाइए जो हाँ कुछ लोग वेट कर रहे हैं क्या देखिए आमिर एच गैंडोमी सर के नाम से आ रहा होगा वो वेट कर रहे हैं क्या वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून सर दिस इज प्रशांत हेलो वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू हाउ आर यू Sir, I am very fine. Sir, we will uh, start in fifteen minutes. Oh, fifteen minutes. Yes, I sir. Said, okay. I, is there any delay, or it's a original sir, program? Sir, it's some uh, people who are online. They are joining right now. So uh, at first they join, and then after we will start. Okay, Just... no problem. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. sure.
हेलो अभी भी नहीं उठे भाई हेलो यस सर हेलो सर प्लीज शेयर योर स्लाइड्स आर यू एबल टू शेयर हेलो हु आर यू टॉकिंग टू कुड यू नेम द पर्सन यस सर यस सर सर इट्स प्रशांत पांडे फ्रॉम दिस साइड फ्रॉम बुद्धा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी Yes. No. So you are uh, talking to me because you. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Are, are you talking to me? Okay. Sure. I can share my slides. Give yes, me sir. a minute. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. यस सर नाउ इट इज विजिबल सो i welcome i prashant pande technical chair of icicat 2023 international conference on iot communication and automation technology welcome all delegates and participants in day 2 and session 1 which is keynote by professor amir hasan gandomi from university of sydney before starting before starting before we starting i would like to give a brief introduction of professor amir hasan gandomi sir professor amir hasan gandomi sir is professor of data science at arc dekra fellow at the faculty of engineering and information technology university of technology city he is also affiliated with okuja university budapest as distinguished professor prior to joining uts professor gandomi was an assistant professor at steven 1000 times and having h index of 91 he has been named as one of the most influential scientific minds and received the highest cited researcher award top 100 publications and point one researchers from web of science for six consecutive years from 2017 to 2022 in recent most impactful research list done by the stanford university and released by elsewhere professor amir hasan gandomi is ranked among top 1000 researcher top 0.1% and top 50% researcher in ai and image processing sub field in 2021 he is also ranked 17 in gp bibliography among more than 50000 researchers he has received multiple prestigious award for his research excellence and impact such as the 2022 walter earl l herbert prize the highest level mid career research award in all areas of civil engineering and ai he has served as associate editor editor and guest editor in several prestigious journals such as ae of idripali network idripali iot journal professor ganjomi is active in delivering keynotes and invited talks his research interests are globally optimization and big data analytics using machine learning and evolutionary computations in particular i welcome on the behalf of buddha institute of technology and conference icicat 2023 i welcome professor amir hasan gandomi sir 
for delivering a keynote on evolutionary intelligence for automated computing. It is really a great pride for us that such an distinguished personality at international level in field of AI has joined us and definitely his words, each, his each and every word will show our researchers, our delegates and our participants new path of thinking and oxygenating their minds with new ideas. Sir, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. First, thank you so much for the uh, nice introduction. So uh, it's uh, really pleasure to deliver a talk in front of uh, colleagues, researchers and professors. And I would like also to thank the organizers for inviting me and having me in this event. So now is the era of big data, AI, automation, uh, etc. I would like to talk about one uh, a special topic uh, on AI. It can be used for automating the computing. It's called uh, genetic programming, and uh, it uh, can be classified in machine learning, AI, uh, data analytics uh, and other tools. So uh, I would like to say I'm a professor at uh, University of uh, Technology, Sydney, and also distinguished professor at Obuda University. So before going to the technical content, I would like to uh, pay respect to the pioneers in the evolution topic. So we can, for uh, evolution philosophy, we can go back to 13th century and uh, talk about Jalaluddin uh, uh, Muhammad Rumi, also known as Maulana, and who believed in uh, evolution in some sort of Darwinian sense, and it can be find in his poems. For example, in one of his poems, he said, I died as mineral and I became a plant. I died as plant and rose to animal. I died as animal and I was man. And of course, theory of evolution uh, proposed in uh, Villanon, uh, Charles Darwin books, theory of evolution based on natural selection. Uh, uh, the book title was uh, on the origin of a species. And talking about machine learning and evolution research, we can go back to Alan Turing uh, paper in 1950, uh, when uh, he mentioned uh, there is a genetic or evolutionary search by which a combination of genes is looked for, the criterion being the survival values. Okay, so accordingly, this uh, presentation has uh, two parts. It's the first part I will mostly talk about how evolutionary intelligence can be used for uh, predictive data analytics, such as regression, classification, uh, clustering, etc. So uh, for a predictive uh, GP as a predictive evolutionary data analytics tool, I uh explain some of the differences with other AI tool probably you all heard about and uh, also explain how it can be used for handling big data. And in a second part, I will briefly talk about how evolutionary intelligence can be used for optimization purposes. I will briefly explain some techniques, key applications, and how we can embed our domain knowledge into this process. So let's start with evolutionary intelligence for data analytics. So we can uh, classify predictive data analytics tools uh, in two different classes, a statistics-based methods such as regression methods or AI-based methods such as uh, neural network, deep learning, uh, SVM and also genetic programming. So the technique that I'm going to talk about is uh, the one uh, that it's mentioned in the bottom right. And when we talk about uh, predictive data analytics tools, we have, uh, when we talk about AI, 
method. We have a natural computation method, which inspired from nature, and also machine learning techniques. And these two have some overlaps. And in this overlap, for example, we have uh, artificial neural network and also evolutionary computation. We recently published a review paper in ACM Computing Survey and uh, briefly explain how these uh, two areas are collide and how evolutionary or natural computation can be combined with uh, machine learning. And when we talk about inspiring from nature, we can go back to some of the quotes from, for example, from Einstein, uh, who said, uh, look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. Or uh, Da Vinci said, nature is the source of all true knowledge. And when someone asks me what is the genetic programming, my simplest answer is when uh, evolution take uh, the lead and do the programming. So evolution become a programmer, it would be genetic programming. So you can see if instead of human, uh, evolution can do the programming for us, it's a very good idea for automation. And it has so many different application actually in uh, Professor John Cosas, a pioneer of uh, genetic programming. He listed more than 80 different applications of genetic programming. Uh, but of course, the most popular one by far is the predictive data analytics. So if you are interested, you can go back to Professor Cosas book. He's a professor at Stanford University and he published a series of books and videos and provide valuable, so valuable sources for uh, researchers in this area. So uh, what's genetic programming? So following the uh, Darwinian natural selection, genetic programming tries to find relationships between inputs and output. And like any other evolutionary process, it has an iterative process, which we call it generation. And it, each generation, we have uh, evolutionary mechanisms such as selection, crossover, and mutation. And inspiring from tree of life, it has a tree structure. We can, and it can be easily translated to uh, explicit uh, formula. And now crossover and mutation can be defined uh, between or within trees. So one of the first successful application of genetic programming was uh, designing uh, NASA communication antenna for the ST5 mission. So the engineers at NASA designed several antennas, but the one designed by genetic programming outperform all of those uh, engineer design. So it becomes well known and it's uh, one of the main application of genetic programming. But how genetic programming could do that? So genetic programming not only can uh, find relationship, but also it can find the structure of that relationship. Yes. So if you look at other machine learning techniques, such as, uh, let's say, artificial neural network, we have a predefined structure, yes? It's a network, we can play with, let's say, number of neurons, number of layers or uh, activation function, etc. But at the end of the day, it has a certain structures. But in genetic programming, we don't have any predefined structures. It starts from scratch and through the evolution, it try to construct the uh, structure. So it gives it, the genetic programming very special uh, power to deal with some problems when we want to not only make the prediction but also find the structure from scratch and using evolution so these actually uh, features of uh, genetic programming leads to uh, its simplicity and explainability so one good example could be the study of 2017 by Kelly et al. Then they uh, used a genetic programming actually uh, to uh, for Atari games. And they compared this genetic programming with uh, several state of the art 
and deep learning, uh, etc. And they found uh, such a simple network here, you can see such simple graph, this genetic program can outperform uh, a deep uh, network with uh, about 800,000 nodes. So this very simple network can outperform that model with actually uh, actually rise up a philosophical question that do we always need to go to very complex model or sometimes if we start from scratch some uh, much simpler model can even have better prediction and of course when we have a simplicity we have uh, lower uh, overfitting potential and we can uh, easily explain the model so this graph is very explainable but a deep neural network with 800,000 nodes, probably not. And this actually line of study continued by others. And in 2018, um, MIT review said neural networks uh, have uh, garnered all the headlines, but a much more powerful approach is waiting in the wing. It was when it was talking about evolutionary algorithm. And another uh, interesting features of genetic programming, especially for automation, is that uh, if, uh, it does the feature selection and model selection inherently. So if you're familiar with this line of research, uh, I, I mean, uh, predictive data analytics, you know, we first need to uh, select the features and actually we need to come up with the best uh, number of features and maybe best combination of features. But uh, genetic programming does it inherently. Or we, when we apply different machine learning, we need to do several trial and error uh, so, and uh, to find the best uh, model at the end. For example, here we try so many different models and eventually one model came on the top. But in genetic program, we don't have any predefined structures. It is automatically try different uh, structures and try to converge to uh, to an optimized structure for the problem. Another difference of ge genetic programming is that unlike other machine learning techniques, it's a population-based algorithm. So when it's a population-based algorithm, uh, we can easily take advantage of parallel processing, cloud systems, uh, distributed system, uh, etc. So I think this is something that nowadays uh, nearly all researchers in this area take advantage of. So let's start from the first example. So the first example is an engineering example. It's uh, this frame. It has uh, post tensioning bar connecting the roof to the ground it has some energy dissipation element and during the uh, earthquake or any other lateral load the one of the column uplift from the base you can see that here so the system has a complex behavior and actually this is the roof response of this structure under mangil earthquake so you can see because as um a structure is complex and earthquake is very uncertain. We have uh, difficulty to find the uh, peak roof drift of such a uh, problem. So we want to predict a peak roof drift of this structure under uh, any specific earthquake. So we have two sets of variables. One of them is a structural variable, let's say uh, geometrical or mechanical parameters, and the other one is earthquake intensity measures. There are so many of them. I only listed 14 of them here. And for the structure, I uh, consider the office building designed for a stiff soil site, uh, designed for uh, LA, California. And this is the SCCBF system that I'm going to talk about. And I considered uh, three elevations, four story buildings, six story and eight story buildings. And I applied uh, and I designed 75 different systems of these systems. And in each of them, I applied 100 
uh, 70 different earthquakes. So now from here, I need to do the selection, but uh, because we have so many uh, earthquake intensity and all of those has nonlinear relationship between uh, input and output, we need to narrow down the number of features. So what I did here is uh, when I we simply look at uh, correlation coefficient, uh, there is a problem in correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient can find linear relationship between two sets of data. But I improved uh, correlation coefficient using genetic programming and came up with this formula. So it can also capture nonlinear relationship between two sets of data. So I will show you how it works. So this is uh, correlation of determination actually correlation coefficient power two and this is the evolutionary evolutionary correlation coefficient power two so you can see in some we have improvement by capturing some nonlinear relationship and in some cases it's about 200 or more than 200 percent improvement in this correlation so it shows the problem highlight the problem of correlation coefficient and how this genetic programming can uh, take care of that so based on that we sell uh, like these uh, three earthquake intensity measures we can we did the modeling these are the pay to front models and eventually we selected this model this is the model that has a good uh, complexity and doesn't have that much difference in accuracy with uh, these other models. So it means it has a trade-off between complexity and accuracy. So from the result, you can see for such a complex system, we came up with a very simple formula using genetic programming. And also we got a very good uh, correlation, 97% between experimental and predicted values. So the second uh, problem could be the inverse analysis in engineering. So as an engineer, we all know how to design, how to do forward analysis, yes? We have input, we give it to the system, it gives us output. So it's a forward analysis. But if we have an input and output and we don't have a system parameters, for example, we want to monitor a system, uh, what can we do? We usually don't have any uh, explicit uh, uh, solution for that. So we usually go back to AI, machine learning, and evolutionary uh, computation for such problems. So this is one system actually designed to find uh, gover governing equation of um, uh, actually constitutive model of any unknown material. So they, this is the actually framework proposed by Professor Kabushi at UIUC. So they run two parallel finite elements, one of them force control, the other one displacement control. They come up with the database, et cetera, and then they uh, design, um, actually train a neural network and they put all this process in a loop until in converge. So what I did here is said, okay, we have unknown material, we using this framework for neural network, but here from here, the system is very complex. We cannot use this constitutive model in action. For example, engineers, it's very hard for them to put, to use this system, for example, put it in a software and use it uh, as a, uh defined material so what i did is simply replace it and uh, now let's work with genetic programming and genetic programming can be easily translated to a mathematical formula then we can easily use it in any uh, software or even for hand calculation so this is the example for uh, this inverse analysis so this is a uh, cantilever truss to uh, load at the end. And this is a force displacement curve. And this is what A and N does. 
for finding this curve. You can see it does a good job, but it's a very complex model. So we replace it with this genetic program. Genetic program is very well matched with the experimental tool. And we put it in the software. So I used Abaco software and compared with a reference model, which was Ramberg Postgood model. And you can see a genetic programming model uh, almost the same as the uh, reference model. The responses are almost the same. So it shows this works very well. And we use it for other system modeling, for example, for aortic modeling in uh, medical or for soil modeling in a geotechnical problem. And it works in all cases. And now uh, there is, uh, we can take advantage of another features of genetic programming. And now, since we have a population of solution, so instead of working with one single solution, we can uh, work with a uh, team of solution. So what we did here is like I said, okay, this is the single best uh, model uh, on training, but we take the let's say 20 or 30 best solution on training and try all this on testing. So these tables are for test data as is highlighted. So you can see for test data, actually team solution provide much better results uh, in uh, most cases here in only in terms of MAE, but in all five other cases here and here, it can outperform the single base solution, which was very interesting for us. And the other thing that we can take advantage of it, since we have a team of solutions, we have a population of solution, we can connect those solutions or can connect gene in the genetic programming using uh, other machine learning and simply, for example, regression analysis. That's something that, for example, Searson did in 2010 in UK and uh, Arnaldo et al. did it in 2014 at MIT. So they both came up with a system of connecting different gene or the different genetic programs using uh, uh, regression analysis. And we can also, and we put it into the test for concrete query problem, we come up with a very simple formula. And these are three genes that are connected using uh, regression analysis. So this is our model. You can see in terms of error and uh, correlation, it's much better than other method out there. So I won't go to the details, but I think the advantage advantages is clear. So we also did it for uh, analysis of signal and doing prediction of uh, if the student learned what it taught in the class. So basically they put uh, four ahead scanner on each student and from the signals, brain signals, they want to see if the student learned what it taught in the class or not. So in this case, we tested GP and compared with other approaches, you can see GP which to 90% accuracy while others are struggling and have much lower uh, accuracy for this problem. And we also did uh, uh, forecasting and uh, uh, time series analysis using genetic programming for uh, COVID and we applied in uh, for different countries and it also performed very well. And now uh, uh, there is a, uh, now we are in an era of big data. Yes, we have so many sensors. We have uh, IoT system, we have high volume. We always uh, reach uh, uh, this big data criteria. We have high volume, high variety and high velocity. And we cannot use and handle these data using regular information processing. So we need to come up with an innovative system. If I want to briefly say what we generate in uh, one minute, we send more than 200 million emails, we uh, 
create 4 million likes, we send more than 250,000 tweets, and we submit more than 2.8 million search queries, and we upload more than 500 hours of uh, movies in or videos into YouTube. And actually, this was kind of all the statistics. These are for uh, two years ago. So you can see how much data we create only in one minute. And based on the Moore's law, we're doubling all data in the history in two years. So you can see how the data is growing based on these more laws. And it's only 2020. If I draw 2022, it would be up to here, I think. So now what we are doing actually in current project is trying to apply genetic programming. We talk about genetic programming. It has very interesting and unique features. It's explainable. Uh, etc. But the thing is, uh, big data is, is a beast, and it's very hard to uh, apply genetic programming or big data problem. So we now are following two uh, different approaches. First, divide and conquer. So we break the uh, big problem into several sub problems with different strategy and try to initialize the structure, etc. And also we try also to extend the genetic programming and maybe couple it with some other uh, machine learning or the, uh, defining new operators, etc. in order to handle uh, big data. So we got good results. For example, this initial study we did in 2021. So we try to use information theory in order to break the big data problem to several uh, smaller sub problem. And this actually works uh, very well. So this is our proposed GP by genetic programming and information theory. We compare it with uh, other genetic programming method, the one proposed by mostly um, uh, MIT Alpha Lab, and we found that we can find uh, much better accuracy in those uh, cases. And in the next slide, I have a, a quick video about our current research. Thank you. So question before starting the second part. So could you tell me how much time do I have? Hello? Yes? I cannot hear you very well. No, it's... Very hard to hear you. Hello? Hello. Would you only give me a minute? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. So, okay. So, how much time do I have from here? Sir, 15 minutes. 15 more minutes. Okay. Okay. I try to wrap it up in five or 10 minutes so we have time for questions. Thank you. 
Okay, so let's start the second part. How we can use evolutionary computation or evolutionary intelligence for optimization purposes. So looking at optimization algorithm, there are two main classes, mathematical optimization, which based mainly use derivative information, uh, they cons mostly concentration matrix, et cetera. And the other one is nature inspired computation such as evolutionary computation or swarm intelligence. And these algorithms uh, are called global optimization because they can handle complex system and different sort of constraint. And they do not use gradient information and they rely on other sources of information such as evolution, uh, swarm, and annealing. And they use... Uh, random numbers in their system. So basically we can also categorize them as a stochastic optimization. And th these are uh, popular algorithm people, several big companies uh, use it, use evolutionary computation for the complex problem. For example, in 90s, Boeing started to use uh, uh, a genetic algorithm for designing uh, G engine and uh, Mersek pharmaceutical used uh, genetic algorithm for discovering a drug for uh, HIV and so many others companies are using it and nowadays for example I know Amazon, Google Brain, Uber, BMW, OLB etc are using evolutionary computation. And talking about the algorithm, probably you heard some of evolutionary optimization algorithms, such as genetic algorithm, simulated annealing, or uh, particle swarm optimization. But there are several others uh, out there that you can also reach uh, out, and some of them works very well. And I list some of them. These are the algorithm that I propose, or I was one of the co-authors uh, of the first paper. And uh, please feel free to reach me if you need uh, any code of this uh, optimization algorithm. I won't go to the detail because it's a lot, but uh, leave you with that one that yeah, you can always reach me out and I will be happy to uh share the codes now i should say this uh last algorithm we proposed this one in 2021 and actually recently received the uh, best theory paper award from ifac over three years period and it, this algorithm works very well they all works well but uh, this actually recently got uh award for its uh, performance and applicability to engineering problems. So this sort of uh, algorithm can deal with a complex system. Let's say if you have any complex system, you let's say it's a software, it's a IoT system, and you need to uh, optimize some of the parameters in the system, you can use this algorithm. For example, we use it for design of these 35 uh, a story a space tower which is a very complex problem it has more than 1200 members more than 900 degree of freedom and you know each member uh, has uh, three constraints so there are so many constraints and variable involved and we also have some geometrical constraint because we want to have uh, control over the structure so uh, we actually tested one of the algorithms called P3 and compared with the state of the art, you can see uh, the accuracy, the fitness and uh, variation is much better than other the state of the art. I should say this algorithm is originally proposed by uh, Dr. Goldman, uh, my colleagues who is currently at Google. And uh, for most real world problems, we have more than one objective. So uh, mathematical optimization algorithm cannot deal with uh, multiple objectives at the same time. So one of the best options for multi or many objectives 
optimization problem is uh, evolutionary uh, intelligence or evolutionary computation algorithm. So we put it in the test. We test 18 different uh, algorithms on three well-known combinatorial problems, uh, knapsack problem, traveling salesman problem, and quadratic problem. And we vary the number of uh, objectives from three to five and 10 to see how this system works. And uh, the results was very interesting. If you are interested, you can also take a look at this published study. And you can also uh, use uh, evolutionary computation for very uh, complex dynamic problem with several with me, uh, with special features. For example, when a um, uh, variable incrementally increase. For example, initially we have five variables, then twenty, and then sixty. So if you have a system, you usually want to expand it. Yes. So number of variable increase. So how we can deal with these sort of problems? This, actually we proposed one in uh, 2019 to use uh, actually coevolution and uh, based on some variable interaction to come up with a strategy in order to deal with this sort of problem. So you can see uh, how we can proceed in that dimension. So. The last topic I would like to talk about is, okay, so I talk about uh, uh, evolutionary intelligence, for example, optimization. But if you are an expert and you know your uh, problem, you can uh, put your expertise into the system or you can put some of the mathematical principle and scientific concept into the optimization process particularly evolutionary computation are very flexible. And if you use those information correctly, they can be very beneficial and they can really boost your optimization process. I actually have one tutorial. I run it in uh, several different conferences and you can find it actually the last year I presented at uh, ACM Gecko and you can find it at ACM website. Uh, it has my uh, presentation, and uh, this year, actually, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to also present it at uh, IEEE CEC. So over there, I went to the detail of where and how you can uh, embed your external knowledge, and from the example, you can also see how they can be beneficial. So I can go to a couple of examples quickly. I, three approaches. I'm not sure how much I can cover right now, but okay. So in some problems, we know, for example, some trend between variables, for example, in this uh, uh, draft shift, you can see from uh, left to right, we know that the cross-section area uh, increase. So that's could be one trend between variables. So we can say monotonically increase from left to right or vice versa, monotonically decrease from right to left. Or in a buildings, we have this system or the uh, airplane wing. And in, the, in so many systems, we have some trend between variables. So from knowing these trends, we define the concept uh, semi-independent variable. So we try to relate the variable together. Not So they are not completely independent now. Now they are dependent in uh, by this trend. So the details can be found in this paper. But if I can give you some example, for example, for designing this retaining ball, we use this concept and you can see with very simple information that says this one should be smaller than this one, this side. Uh, we got good advantage in, so, uh, in uh, convergence and also finding even better solutions. So the other uh, approach is boundary updating. It says uh, how to deal with uh, 
uh, nonlinear constraint during the uh, boundary constraint handling. So this, I won't go to detail, probably it's out of the time here. It has some mapping and we published this one in 2022 at Computer Methods in Applied uh, Mechanics and Engineering. And uh, uh, you can see, instead of going and searching the whole search space, by updating the boundaries, we only search within the feasible area. Could be very beneficial. For example, for this uh, uh, case study here, you can see this is the whole search space, but the feasible area, it's only this narrow valley in here. So what we did is using this boundary updating approach, and now the, all the solutions are created in this area. So you can see how beneficial it can be. And we also tested it in this uh, problem. It has 100 constraints. So in the next step, in the first step, we try to only handle 50 constraints. And in the second step, we try to handle all 100 constraints using this boundary updating approach. So you can see, this is the original convergence. This is the handling 50 constraints using uh, this approach. And this is uh, handling 100 constraints in this approach. So you can see it can be very beneficial. And benefits is clear with all algorithms. In PSO, it's beneficial. In GA, beneficial. In DE, it's beneficial. And even the constraint violation, it's much less when we handle all 100 constraints using this approach. And we test this on this car side problem. So some of the problems are very complex. For example, this car side, it's a finite element model for each part, etc. In order to using and simplifying this model, we can replace it with surrogate model. For example, like here. So this problem is simplified with surrogate model and then boundary updating can be used. So you can see we have advantages of better convergence, uh, lower uh, constant violation, uh, and etc. And this is the multi-objective. So these uh, orange dots are without this boundary updating and the other uh, blue and greens are two different uh, approaches for uh, boundary updating. You can see the uh, spread and uh, number of non-dominated solution is much higher when we use this uh, boundary updating. And finally, variable uh, functioning. So when we have several variables in our problem, we may know some relationship between those variables and we know some function, yes? So we can also take advantage of it. I won't go to the detail, but this paper is published and you can look uh, into it. So let's skip the basics. Okay, why it don't go for, okay, hold on. Okay, it seems it has an issue. Anyway, so I think I can wrap up here and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. It was of course. It was really very great, great to hear you because you does you have uh, introduced us that uh, uh, AI or automation is the need of not only one particular branch a person can't relate it only with the CS or IT, but with the lab, with the examples you have shown it, that it can be used to ensure the optimization and automation in mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and many other fields, medical, healthcare, or many other fields. Yeah, yes. yeah that's great. Yes. Now... <laughs> Uh, we are really very thankful that you started uh, the presentation or your speech with uh, uh, showing that why it is needed, why it is 
required that uh, we uh, uh, why the what are the inter, what are the different intelligent or machine learning algos are there and how genetic programming can be more effective in using these and definitely you also shown that how the mathematical formulation can become easy by using genetic mm, programming yes. and the complex mathematical problems can be reduced into small into simpler mathematical formulas by using this and when in the era of we are moving towards era of iot the data which we will get from the outside world will be really very large so definitely these algos have to be updated so that it can be used for the big data and your work and your contribution in different optimization algorithms are uh, outstanding and uh, the all the researchers who are joined here with us and uh, you definitely will be benefited with uh, going through all these algos and can use those algos in their modern problem or you have also said that they can uh, ask by the code if they require and definitely you are very open for it so thank you very much sir uh, you for your these uh, uh, blessings to us and uh, uh, you have definitely shown uh, a new pathway to the research opportunity here and uh, uh, this keynote by you will definitely embark new ideas in the uh, minds so that the people will use those your proposed algorithms in their own work and uh, get more better results thank you very much sir thank you for having me so if you have any question feel free to ask or even email me if you don't have time yeah yes yes sir uh, sir have uh, sir it was really very nice to have you sir thank you sir thank you have a nice day this was the keynote third keynote session international keynote session the best part of this conference is that we were having four keynote session and all the keynote session this time have been uh, from international keynote speaker only so first one was from Dr. Kumar Krishan from NASA, USA. And the second one was from Dr. Jay Gobind Singh, sir. It was from Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, Thailand. Then it was uh, Professor Amir H. Gandomi, sir, University of uh, Sydney, uh, Australia. And now we'll having offline session. Uh, he's Dr. Nilesh Goel, Associate Professor, BITS uh, Pilani, Dubai campus. He is present right now in the campus. He will be arriving within five minutes and uh, he will be delivering his uh, keynote session. After keynote, uh, we'll have high tea and then at 11.30, we'll start with the parallel session. I also request the parallel sessions uh, participants, if you are present here, uh, kindly give your PPT to the our volunteers. Our volunteers will help you in saving the PPT. And please save the PPT by paper ID name only. Okay. And uh, today we have validatory session also. In that session, you will be given your uh, certificate. So please do not go. Uh, have your lunch. After lunch, you will have validatory session. And we will wind up till 5 p.m. Right. Thank you.
सर ऑनलाइन चलाना है हाँ होगा प्रेजेंटेशन करेंगे सर नहीं ऑनलाइन भी दिखा दे हाँ दिखा दो After having three keynote international keynote speeches today, uh, we are very grateful that we are having uh, the next one in offline mode. And for the offline mode, we have with us Dr. Nilesh Goel, Associate Professor at Pilani, Dubai Campus, Dubai. A huge round of applause for our keynote speaker also. And uh, right now, our observer sir is also with us, uh, Dr. Rafi Kamar. Once again, sir, uh, we welcome you. And uh, Communication Chair, Dr. Varun Karthar, sir, we all uh, once again welcome you for the day two. So, dear students, participants, delegates, uh, let me introduce the uh, speaker. Dr. Nilesh Goyal is currently Associate Professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering at Gibbs Pilani Dubai Campus. Dr. Goyal is a senior member of IEEE. He received his BTEC degree in Electronics and Communication Engineering from Motilal Nehru Institute of Technology, Alaba, in 2007. From 2007 to 2010, he was at SD Microelectronics Greater Noida, India, where he worked as a digital front-end design and engineer. He completed his PhD in 2015 from Electrical Engineering Department at IIT Bombay. After that, he was with Sandus as a staff device engineer, where he works as reliability and characterization engineer for 2D and 3D NAND uh, flash memories. Then he joined Bits Milani Dubai campus in 2017 as a assistant professor. He has published 15 journal papers, 24 conference papers, authored 11 book chapter, editor of one book, and two patent file in his name. His research work has more than 1100 citations. He is a reviewer of several international journals. His research interests include reliability, characterization, and modeling of semiconductor devices. He is currently working on the impact of reliability issue on neural body circuit. And the topic of today talk will be reliability aware neuromodulated circuit for the automation. First of all, a warm welcome with a huge round of applause for the speaker. And without wasting any time, I will hand over uh, this platform to you so that with his knowledge and kind words of wisdom, we all will be blessed. Thank you, sir. Can I use this mic? Yeah, but that is for online. Okay. Hello. Hello. Good morning, guys. Uh, so today, more than uh, giving a talk, I would like to have a interaction with you. And uh, wherever you find that things are not uh, easy to understand, we uh, come to me and talk. And I will discuss it. Okay. So instead of a talk, I will uh, like to convert it to a lecture. So you see a couple of words here: reliability aware neuromorphic circuits for automation. So what is uh, neuromorphic circuits? What is automation? And what do you mean by reliability aware? So I will briefly discuss, uh, or I should say, in detail, discuss these things first. And in the last, I will discuss what the work which we have done uh, in very few slides in the end. So this is my background. Uh, professor has already given my uh, brief intro about you. OK, so this is the content for my talk today. First, I will give you the brief introduction about the reliability, why it comes in over there. What do you mean by neuromorphic circuits? A little background of that. And then I will discuss the results and uh, with you. And finally, I will conclude my talk with the future perspectives. OK. So this slide shows that how the uh, devices got uh, improved over the lifetime. So okay. So if you see here, 
these are the two dimensional mosfets which we study in our classrooms okay so these got engaged till 32 nanometer technology and uh, got absolute around 2008 2010 then here the finfet comes in finfets is a three dimensional structure transistors uh, starting from uh, 22 nanometers and beyond and here today uh, these are the gate all around or nano sheet transistors uh, which are uh, you can see from 5 nanometer onward and uh, you see in next September, uh, the Apple iPhones are coming in. Those are 3 nanometer technology. So, 3 nanometer is not a future, it's a quite uh, present for us. And after 3 nanometer, we have 2 nanometer, uh, which they call it 20K. 2 nanometer means 20 strong. So, 20 k they call it, then 1.8 and 1.5, and all those things now. So, uh, the most aspiring uh, future generation transistor is called super transistor in which uh, and most of the was will be set on top of each other with the same silicon area. So, all these things, when we reduce the transistor size, is uh, because of two reasons. First, we want to reduce the footprint of transistor on the silicon because silicon is very costly. So, we want to uh, minimize the area of the silicon you could use and also to enhance the performance of the transistor. But in all this race, when we gain a lot, we have to lose a lot as well. So what we lose, we lose the uh, reliability of the transistor. So it looks like when you drive, when you buy a new car, okay, it drives very nice, very smooth, very smooth. But over the time, few years, it got old, it, it's, it got in not that late, right? It uh, got slowed down and it disappeared so smooth. So it has got a lot of moving parts in it. Now, same thing happens to the transistor also. Okay. Now, you know, wonder that transistor doesn't have any moving parts. So why it got degraded? Why is the wear and tear in the transistor? So what happens actually uh, from outside what you it looks like transistor is very uh, calm device. But if you look carefully, you will see that electric fields in the transistor are of like a volt per centimeter. It means a uh, power line which has a one more than one million volts into it, it has a stress of that uh, voltage or that electric field within the small transistor. And the electrons moving from source to green. They are also moving very rapidly. They are getting the other electrons, getting the uh, other silicon atoms, other uh, nearby dopant atoms and all, very interesting. So it kind of damages the structure also over time. So uh, whenever the transistor is designed, it is designed for 10 years of life. So, so all those kind of uh, issues are shown here. These are the reliability issues in the transistor. Another important uh, issue which comes in a modern day transistor is the process variability. So it's like when I told you to manufacture uh, two bricks, for example, so or two blocks of uh, wood, that uh, if the block size is one meter by one meter by one meter, you can finally uh, make uh, two blocks which look very similar inside. But now at the same time, I tell you now the now make the size of the uh, block only by one millimeter by one millimeter. Hello, sir. Okay, so the two blocks could not be of very same size. Right, so we need not. Hello. Hello. Screen is not visible. Screen, sir. Check the slides. Screen is not visible. Right. You see there, one of the slides stuck here. Slide is stuck here. First slide is here. First slide is here. First slide is here. Please, Next, 
तो सॉरी गाइस सॉरी फॉर इंटरप्शन okay so i was talking about the uh, issues in the gravity so i told you that uh, because of so much uh, vigorous uh, things happening in the planet itself there is a gravity issue in the planet now there is another uh, gravity issue in the planet which is called process variation so when you manipulate the planet itself no two planets are identical right we want they are supposed to be identical But they are not identical because they are so small that uh, uh, you can't make them identical. Now, look at the right side here. So this is a typical lifetime graph of a uh, transistor. So when we when we manufacture billions and billions of transistors. Many of the times that got died within the uh, few days of the life, right? Within the testing phase itself, we phase out the transistors, like which we call infant mortality. Means a a kid is born and it is died. Then over the age, after a few years, five, ten years and all, they start dying. But this is the normal lifetime: one year, a uh, few months to five, ten years. Now, now I will talk, talk about the neuromorphic computing. What is neuromorphic computing? Uh, what is non-neuromorphic computing? So that, so in our uh, cell world, we have uh, two types of microprocessors. The microprocessor is used in our daily life, in our laptop, in our mobile phones. They are called uh, non-monument architecture. And the other ones, which we use, uh, which we are trying to use for AI, uh, like uh, neural codes, they are called Uh, non modular architecture or neuromorphic architecture so what is the difference in one given architecture the microprocessor reads the data from memory memory could be your ram you or uh, your hard drive and then process the data and then send it forward while a uh, neuromorphic company our brain what it does it processes the data within the memory so it just saying it Uh, a work of step of reading the data and writing the diagram data so this is the bottleneck in today's modern human architecture that no matter how much uh, we have to do like one is hard two is hard three is hard four is hard but you have to read the data you have to write the data so with this your speed but our uh, processing speed not limited but tomorrow with the ai technology of processing the data within the memory then it becomes very very fast You know, uh, our battery pressure does not have even high computation, but the world of frequency of a brain. Anybody can guess how much frequency of a brain? 
You see the first part for operation in microprocessors, it is sequential, while in neuromorphic processor, it is heavily parallel because at the same time, all the memory elements in the brain, right? You can process the data simultaneously. In organization, so here memory and computation are done separately. So memory, we read the data from memory, the computer, process it, and then send it back. While in neuromorphic computing, the memory uh, itself will act as a processor. Within the memory, we do the operation. So with this, we avoid the reading and writing back the data. And how the communication happens? In our normal CPUs, the binary numbers, logic 0, logic 1, these are the binary data in which we process. While in neuromorphic, the spikes, you see like this here, these are the spikes in, the, in which form the processing is done or information is stored. Our CPU runs on a clock. Clock signal means a square wave signal, which we call it 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz of microprocessor, that one. Uh, and CPU runs on this clock. While for neuromorphic, it doesn't require any clock signal at all. It is highly asynchronous. So it is very fast. Now, I'll give you a brief intro uh, about from how neuroscience, the biological ones, will go to the neuron models in mathematics and all, and then to neuromorphic systems in electronics. So in the left side, you see this thing small. This is a brain neuron. It, okay, And this is the memory cell where the information is stored in, in the form of charges. How much charge, how much voltage is there in the neuron? Okay, and you see, uh, with one neuron, there could be more than one neurons connected before it, okay, which can be which are giving signals to it. And when many neurons are giving signals to it, the charge over here got changed. It could be increased or decreased. And with, with the amount of charge, it is actually defining the processing here. And then ultimately, when a charge reaches a sufficient number, this neuron will send a spike signal outside. So it receives a lot of input signals and go out as one signal here. So this is how the neuron works. And the connection between one neuron here and the previous neuron is called synapse. So synapse is like a uh, connection between the two neurons uh, whose strength is two Okay. So uh, that's the main memory element between the two transistors, two neurons. Uh, so if the two neurons, uh, let me give an example here. So let's say uh, you are hungry. Okay. So the stomach will be sending some neurons to your brain. Okay. Some neurons. Then I bring the food to the brain. So I will just clean the food and make that positive figure or a negative figure. Like if the food looks very good to you, send the positive figure to the same neuron. Okay. Understand. But if the food is looking very bad, then it will send a negative figure to the brain. Okay. Third thing, smell. If the food is smelling very nice, right? Again, one of the things you can tell your face. But food is smelling very badly, the name is going to be said. So, the submission of these three types of things signal from your stomach, signal from your eye, and signal from your nose. When these are added up and sufficient cells is there, then only you will be uh, urged to see something. Now, if any one of these is failed, for example, your stomach is full. You are no more hungry. So no matter how great the pizza is in front of you, you are hungry. Right? And if you are very hungry, uh, but your eyes and uh, nose say, no, it's not a food. But you are hungry for several days. No matter how the food is, you will definitely eat. So about the strength of the signal, who wins? Okay? So each of the signals can uh, send a positive and a negative signal. Okay? So the permission of these three, Will uh, uh, finally decide what to do. So this is how the brain works basically. The same thing has been different uh, modeled into different mathematical models in neuron. So so these are uh, represented here in the circles. So if you want to try 
more and more biologically closed uh, neuron, then our mathematics become more and more complicated. So the circuits will also be. So to make the life simpler, we say, okay, I want only 80% of the behavior, but let me, let's make the life easier. So we use these kind of uh, models, which are only 90% or 80% close to the uh, biology, but are quite a very simple circuits. The same thing is shown here in a neuromorphic system. When we have multiple neurons are sending signals to, through synapse to this neuron, and this neuron will decide whether I should send a spike or not. And these signals are like signals from brain, uh, signals from eyes, signals from nose, and signal from stomach. Okay, And then ultimately, I will decide whether I should eat the food or not. So this is an electronic form here. I'll skip this slide. Uh, okay, I'll quickly brief it. So these three points I already mentioned. The last part over here, you see, the reliability aware circuit. So the thing is, when the neuron has to decide to send the information from me, whether I need to eat the food or not eat the food, those are in the form of spikes. So if the spikes are discharged, if the spikes are generated by mistake, right, by the circuit is a cold, Right. So, uh, even if you are not hungry, even if the food is not good, uh, well, uh, uh, you should not send up out of But if the circuits are wrong, they are wrongly behaving, they will send a spike and it will be good. So, the circuit should be very much reliable. So, you can't uh, afford the circuit to be in this uh, thing. So, the reliability of the circuits is the main task is the spike will always be sent on the right time and then the right thing. If there is no need of spike, no spike. If spike is sent, then only spike should be sent. Okay. This is again a closer look of a uh, biological neuron. You see here in the brain. These kind of wide network of uh, uh, neurons and synapses here. You see this thing? This is a closed look of synapse. So here, if this connection is very strong, it means even if you are slightly hungry, it will send a strong signal to the brain and you will be urged to eat the food. Right? So uh, like some people are like, they say that I can't uh, afford to be hungry. I, if I am feeling hungry, I have to food, uh, eat the food immediately. While others will say, okay, I am fine. Even a couple of hours, I can stay hungry. So those who are unable to stay hungry for some time, it means the connection between the two synapses is very strong. They can't stay hungry. The others who can stay hungry for some time, the signal is, uh, the or the, the strength between the two communication signal is quite weak. Okay, so they can stay hungry for some time. Now, what the spike I'm talking about, this is the kind of spike which the human brain uh, neuron generates. Or this one. So multiple spikes from multiple sources can come up, got added up within the neuron, and then a neuron will decide how to send a output signal. So here, the processing is happening within the neuron itself. Within the memory element, the processing is happening. It will decide whether I should... Uh, send a spike outside or not, and it is receiving many input signals from here. So this saves reading the data from memory and writing back data to memory. So that stuff is removed here. And all of you knows that our human brain or the humans are very good in image recognition. I can very easily uh, recognize what kind of image is. But the same thing we are going to write in uh, AI, right? So, but AI is not very smart or very good uh, in doing so. It's a conventional mind person. But if you implement that neuron, this uh, mind person, which is in the app of M1 and M2 chip, it has few neural core functions. And uh, let's say there are few uh, dedicated mind person chip. Like, uh, if there's no heat, I get do not with that chip, which are dedicatedly only having neural core, they doesn't have conventional speaking code. So, those are made that uh, very dedicated chip for the uh, 
Okay. So again, when we have multiple neurons connected to it, so this is my, let's say my main neuron, this is the input neuron, which is sending signals to me. And this is somewhere I'm sending the signal outside. And this is the neuromorphic system in electronic circuit, form circuit. So now let's say this is the voltage of my neuron. If the voltage of the neuron crosses this signal, this level or this threshold, then only the spike will happen. Otherwise spike will not. So for example, I'm feeling a little bit of hungry. The voltage starts increasing fine. But then I see there is a food. Then again, I see the spikes, uh, the voltage got increased, but here I smell the food, which is not very great. So the voltage starts reducing here. Fine. The food is not smelling very great. So this is a negative signal to me. So voltage starts reducing. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not getting the urge to eat the food. Again, I got a signal. No, no smell is bad, but it looks good. Fine. I go up. Then again, I see the emission. No, it's not a uh, great food. It's going down. Then I feel, no, I'm feeling too much of hungry. I have to eat the food. So ultimately the voltage reaches this level and a spike is generated, which is my urge to eat the food. Okay. So ultimately whenever this threshold is crossed, only then the spike is generated and it could be, uh, the spike can, the voltage can be increased or decreased depending on the, uh, signals, whether I'm coming with the positive signals or negative signals to the neuron. The same thing I'm giving here with an example. Let's say to a small kid, okay? If you give this um, a glass of milk, they will say, no, I don't want to drink the milk. So it's a negative signal to their brain. Yet they are hungry, but they won't drink the milk. Then I will say, okay, don't drink the milk. We'll give you the milk with some cookies, okay? All your cookies. So they have some positive signal that, okay, I want your cookies are great, but still this is the milk also. They say, no, I want to drink the milk. Uh, even though you are giving the Oreo cookies, but then a smart mother makes up Oreo milkshake. It smells very nice, it looks very nice, and the kid is hungry and also. Then, what are the positive signals? And ultimately, the spike is in it, and the kid is ready to drink the milkshake. And the content is same the milk and the Oreo shake uh, biscuits. Right? So, this is how you can. Uh, uh, the human brain or the mothers, I should say, use the AI to uh, urge their kids to drink the milk. But the same thing happens in the electronic circuits also. Now, now come to what little of electronics are made on the working principle on uh, signal on spikes. How these spikes make uh, some sense? You know, uh, logic zero, logic one, you all of you are the same, right? How the body numbers work. But how the uh, coding techniques in neuromorphic systems with the spikes are work. So there are two things, rate encoding and temporal encoding. So first I will explain you rate encoding. So let's say at the input, one spike has come. Now within the next fixed uh, few milliseconds, whether I'm missing one spike, two spike, five spikes or eight spikes over here, like example over here, that will tell you the strength of the input signal. I got one signal at the input, but I'm generating only one at output or I'm generating 10 at output. So I'm defining the connection between the input signal. So the connection between the input and the output is very weak. If input and output goes one is to one. If input is one, but the output is so many signals within the same time, it means my connection is very strong. This is called rate encoding. How much is the rate of my spikes? Second is temporal coding. So temporal coding is again done by two ways. First is whenever my input signal comes in after that, how much time it will take to generate the output spike. If I'm generating the output spike immediately, it means my strength is very nice, good or very strong. But if input spikes comes in and I'm generating the output spike after a long time, a delay, it means uh, the strength signal is quite weak. 
The second type of tem temporal encoding is I got one spike at the input, but at the output, I'm generating two spikes. The two spikes, how much is the gap between two spikes? So, which we call it as ISI, inter spike interval. You see this? So, example one here, these two spikes are quite close. These two spikes are quite far. So, these two spikes shows that the strength is very good. But these two spikes shows that the strength is quite weak. Uh, I will explain the same concept in the next slide here. So, for example, we have a uh, visual information from a video camera, which is encoded in terms of pixels or spikes. Let's say these are the images of different shades of the blue. Okay. So, the pixel intensities are shown here. The pixel intensity here with time. So, pixel number one, pixel number two, three, four, five. So, these are the pixel intensities. Right. Now, if I want to represent them digitally in logic zero, logic ones, so this is a kind of intermediate blue. So, in four bits, I'm defining it as zero, zero, one, one. The next one is kind of very light blue or whitish. I'm just defining it as logic one. The third is a darker blue, 0, 1, 1, 0. The fourth is a little lighter, 0, 0, 1, 0. And the last one is very dark blue. I'm representing it with a larger binary number, 0, 1, 1. Okay. So this should be very clear to you, the binary numbers which we all deal with. Now, now when we want to encode them with spikes, we have three main things. What is the rate encoding? Another is... Uh, time between uh, this time to spikes and third is inter spike interval. So now if you convert 0, 0, 1, 1 into rate, so I have three spikes here. 0, 0, 0, 1, only one spike in the interval. 0, 1, 1, 0, four spikes in the interval. 1, 0, two spikes and triple one, lots of spikes. So more the number of spikes, the darker the blue color is. Lesser the number of spikes, the lighter the blue color is. The other thing is, if blue color is very light, for example, here, the spike comes very late. You see here, after this, the spikes comes very late. But in the last, the blue color is very dark, this one. Then the spike comes immediately after time starts here. This is another kind of encoding. The third way, which is inter-spiking interval, the gap between the two spikes. So if the blue color is very light, for example, here, the time between the two spikes is quite large. And here, the blue color is very dark. The time between the two spikes is quite small. So these are the three ways in which one can do the encoding or the brain does the encoding. Uh,
हो गया दीदी Okay, so as in the starting of my talk, I told that uh, trans cells degrade over time. The performance for slow down, uh, so they don't they doesn't remain as we expect them on the day one. So while the trans cell doesn't remain the same, the circuit also doesn't remain the same. They may not be generating the spike at the time that you want or when they are expected to generate. So this will lead to the false false information. Now when you see here, here. If instead of three, I am generating two spikes or four spikes, which then it makes a difference in the uh, colors. Over here, if I am generating the spike before or after the, uh, the desired time, then also the information can be misjudged. Over here also, if the gap between the two spikes is not seen, it changes over time for the same color. It means I am predicting the color as a different color tomorrow. So today I'm predicting as a light blue, but tomorrow after five years, 10 years, I'm predicting same color as a dark blue. Okay. So uh, this is the motivation behind our work that there is a need for reliability of a circuit design uh, for neuromorphic circuits. So uh, here is a block diagram of, a, uh, of circuits, which here we took one neuron which is a category of uh, adoptive exponential neuron circuit and we have three different synapses connected to it and these three synapses are giving spikes to the neuron and they are uh, either positive spikes or negative spikes then all are summed up here and then sent to the neuron then neuron will decide whether i need to send a uh, output spike or not Okay, so what are the key findings we have? So when we do the, uh, when we so first we decide, uh, design all these uh, neurons and synapses in a software tool called Cadence Virtuoso using 45 nanometer technology transistors. And then we apply the reliabilities on them. So we find out that the, the spikes are getting moved away from their desired locations. So it means, the uh, prediction of the colors and all those things going to be different from the ones which we are expect expected. So we start looking back and identify the blocks which are responsible for it. So with this, we give the contribution. Uh, so this is our entire contribution to the work that reliability analysis in neuromorphic circuit was investigated th thoroughly. And there is an increase in uh, demand for these kind of circuits in the uh, industry. And hence, we find that there is a lot of increase or decrease in output timing and frequency of these circuits. Okay, So which is actually distorting the information. So lighter blue will become darker blue, darker blue, blue can become a lighter blue color. So we have uh, identified a, a novel circuit, which is we have filed a patent as well. Uh, uh, I, unfortunately, these slides become blank where uh, some images are here. So I can show you the circuit there, but anyway. So uh, the whole work is then published in uh, several international journals and a uh, patent being filed for uh, this circuit. Now, uh, the future scope of the work is, we have only worked upon a couple of neuroid uh, transistors, uh, neural circuits and trans circuits. But there is a lot of scope uh, because in, uh, in uh, literature, there are around uh, 75 plus uh, neural circuits. Why we have only a third neural circuit? So, uh, anybody who is interested in uh, 
there is a hot in rural circuit. Uh, it's for that me and please, if we talk, we can uh, work on these circuits. And at the last, we have impact, uh, analyzes the impact of the degradation mechanism like NBTI, PBTI, SCI, self-heating. These are my references. And thank you. Thanks for talk. Thanks for time. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, sir, for, for taking this keynote speech. And first of all, Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, Dr. Sayyas sir has given your name and then we send you a mail and you uh, promptly replied to us and you were ready to join us. And actually your session was scheduled for 23rd, but due to some reason, I requested you to reschedule it on 24 and you promptly said no problem. So thank you so much. Once again, a huge round of applause for our keynote speaker, Dr. Nile. We we are initiating for a demo use or two which are used as the same demo thing. They talk about that. And uh, one more uh, announcement is that our uh, sessions will start at 11 30. So now I will reserve my volume here. Paper ID 11 to 12 30, this is the presentation. We will be able to get the paper. 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 We will be able to get the paper